Uh, Dr. Barry Fatherford is, well, she told me a musician, but um, uh, 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 Rose Bay general practitioner and uh, president of the uh, uh, Doctors for Refugees, uh, which was founded in 2013 after the revelations about Manus and how the, the, the ma mis ma medical mismanagement and, and there. Uh, I think you told me there are eight doctors involved, seriously involved in, is that right? Or yeah, about that any one time, looking at medical records, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm sure you'll want to say more. Um, so, and uh, with a fantastic website, oh yes, and uh, politics should never, politics should never compromise healthcare, which is sort of, it's been killing people lately. Um, so that's, a, uh, that's from the website, politics should never compromise healthcare. Uh, so that's a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing on the website. And uh, from a personal point of view, I watched this film, um, against our oath about doctors under terrible regimes. And uh, th then we have this one, and it's film seems to be like a series of hapless doctors individually confronting this wretched um, phalanx of Nazis out of uniform. That's my way of looking at it. Of, of these people from the immigration department and so on, um, being extremely coercive and these doctor, doctors singly and individually trying to confront them. And what I think is fantastic is that Dr. Barry is the first person to get the bloody doctors together and, and face, face them off, face them down. So uh, the guts and the gumption to do that. So I think that's, that's remarkable in itself and, and uh, very much needed. So. Um, and David Shoebridge is, the, well, neither the person needs any really much introduction, but um, uh, if you like Lee, Rhea, like Lee Rhiannon, you're just always there, uh, you know, when you're asked to be there, you know, we want someone a, a bit credible to speak. A bit uh, credible. To, to, make, uh, to, to make us look not like a bunch of uh, misfits. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, the answer's nearly always yes, and it's always favourable, and it's always great. And uh, former barrister, uh, I can't read my own writing, uh, m member of, a Green member of the New South Wales Legislative Council since September 2010. You live in Wallara, and uh, sounds like this is your life, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and this is your former what, no. Um, uh, what else am I going to say? Um, Yes, and, and you, you had a recent thing with, which we were talking about earlier with, with a, a former staffer, which you've admirably stood by her. And uh, so, uh, look, it's wonderful to, it's like, it's just, it's difficult to, to, to sort of introduce people you personally really admire. It sounds a bit like, but yeah, so it's really wonderful to have you here both speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. What? Oh, give it to me. sorry. Thank you. I told you about the mouse, didn't I? Yes. Shut up, Stephen. Thank you very much, Dr. Barry. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past and present. So we're talking tonight about the urgent need for a Human Rights Act. So the first thing we need to ask is, what is a Human Rights Act? Well, there are many definitions of human rights, so it's probably easiest to look at what was contained at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Now the range of rights that were included in this document were civil and political rights, such as the right to be able to vote and to a fair trial, economic and social rights including health and education, the rights of a child, ending discrimination against women and racial and ethnic minorities, freedom from torture and other cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment, and a host of others. Now these ideas obviously didn't just emerge in the middle of last century and generally they've had their basis in many of the world's great religions as well as from philosophers through the ages. Although tragically after World War II the world needed reminding of fundamental ethics and so these were ratified into the one document. Australia is one of the founding countries that have signed up to this but signing up to this is not enforceable in our domestic law. 
And so all the UN member states need to enact their own document, the Charter or an Act. Australia is the only Western liberal democracy to not have our own Human Rights Act, with countries with similar systems of government like the UK, USA, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa all having one. So why does Australia not have one and what does this mean? So looking at the second question first, we can examine the current status of Australia's human rights according to the United Nations. The Universal Periodic Review, or UPR, is a UN Human Rights Council which records, which records the human rights record of each UN member state every five years over a broad range of international human rights obligations. So how did we do? Generally speaking, for workers' rights, we're really quite high. In terms of uh, preventing and eliminating discrimination against women, we're also comparatively high, although we were somewhat late coming to parental leave and our gender pay gap has fluctuated in the last decade. Regarding LGBT, we've recently come up quite dramatically to speed, but even prior to the same-sex marriage law, we had several parameters that still fell quite into the high compliance category. Australia has one of the highest, highest scores in terms of access to healthcare, uh, for relative freedom of religion, disability services and other welfare benefits. And we also sit amongst very high scores elsewhere in a wide range of parameters. So on the surface of it, it can hardly seem the need for a Human Rights Act, and certainly opponents of the Human Rights Act would say as much. But then we look at the two areas that were highlighted by the UPR, which is indefinite detention of asylum seekers, and the shocking levels of incarceration of the Indigenous community, and we realise that we actually do have significant failings. During one such UPR assessment at the 2015 UN Summit in Geneva, 110 countries, which is more than half of the countries of the UN, made 300 recommendations for Australia to improve our human rights record. And because of the large number of countries who specifically wanted to comment on Australia, each nation had only 65 seconds in which to address Australia's human rights regime overwhelmingly about these two issues. Our treatment of the indigenous community and that of asylum seekers. Now that Australia's indigenous population is the highest single group incarceration in the world is an absolute source of shame. And so too our policy of mandatory detention of asylum seekers, which first began in 1992 under the Keating government and has been out of step with the rest of the world, with the rest of the world ever since. Ever since this time, there have been demonstrations, there have been legal challenges, protests, and even millions of dollars paid by federal six successive federal governments in compensation. From as far back as 20 years ago, the government was ordered to pay a then record of around $400,000 plus over $1 million for the legal fees for a family of a six-year-old boy who was found to be traumatised in detention to the point where Minister, then Immigration Minister Ruddock apparently wrote Buckley's on his file in response to a question as to his chance of recovery. And this notation was submitted in evidence in the court case. As recently as 2017, the federal government was forced to pay a total of $75 million to a group of men on Manus Island. Now, these are Australian courts that have made these determinations. So, Australian policy, certainly as they pertain to asylum seekers, and quite probably in many more cases, effectively violate even Australia's own laws, which is clearly an absurd situation and one that can be neatly rectified in Parliament by enacting new laws that make the objectionable treatment suddenly legal. Now, with all these human rights violations being widespread, would a hum in Australia, would a Human Rights Act prevent this? We've seen cases of police, police brutality against African Americans, and yet US has a Bill of Rights. So how much does legislation control for bad behaviour and racist attitudes? Now, David, who's speaking next, is in a far better position than myself to comment on this. But it's clear that having a background of standard basic rights to which all new legislation, court judgment, police action, and all other agencies are filtered can only be of benefit. So we therefore need to change 
at the community attitudes, the community level, our attitudes as well. To do this, we need to critically look at how we got to this place and work through any discomfort it may bring. It's well known that one of the newly federated Australia's first acts was the Immigration Restriction Act, also known as the White Australia Policy. And equally, that this was brought in by the precursor to the current Labor Party, which was then made up largely of trade unionists. As a result, Australia's new economy had and that still continues to have some of the most enviable workplace conditions in the world. These achievements have combined to ensure that not only a high minimum wage, safety at the work site, sick leave, penalty rates, functioning work cover program, as well as unemployment benefits, disability benefits, single parent allowance, age pensions and so much more. And that many of these can effectively continue for our entire life is unheard of in many other countries in the developed world. Now, clearly we can't declare the industrial relations battle won, and nor can we be complacent that changes won't start getting eroded by stealth any time in the future, as we've seen them happen recently. But we also can't continue to deny that the social makeup and diversity of Australia has changed considerably since the beginning of the 20th century. Now, at a time, a hundred years ago, when there was no regard for the indigenous community who were routinely enslaved, forcibly separated from family and denied basic forms of justice. No concern to migrant workers who, despite forming families, having children here, were not permitted to stay, live or become a citizen. Scant regard for women who had little financial independence and, base, and, and virtually no pro provisions for those with disability and of course homosexuality was, was illegal anyway. Now in this time, the working class white male may well have appeared the most disenfranchised of the already relatively enfranchised group, and so priority their needs likely made sense for a coordinated movement across, against the establishment. The problem is now, when we continue this decades later, to the exclusion of acknowledging or addressing other systemic injustices that in fact may well be impacted even further by one group's gains. Essentially, exploding the myth that we need to compete against each other for finite resources. Currently, the proportion of people in Australia who identify as non-white is around 25%. Now, this figure comes from um, a report by the Australian Human Rights Commission in 2018 called Leading for Change. And it's based on the 2016 census figures, but the census figures themselves don't break down by race. So it can be hard to get exact numbers and people can, in fact, nominate more than one ancestry. But in any event, it seems odd to have such a high figure, one in four, when representations all around us in the media, in senior manager, managerials and CEO and other positions seem so starkly white. And although, although there has been a noticeable shift in recent years. In countries such as the USA, Canada, New Zealand and UK, it's common to see representations of racial diversity um, as TV hosts or panellists, whereas in Australia, it's uh, an unfortunately regular occurrence to see four white spokesperson on any morning show discussing racial issues, seemingly blithely unconscious to the irony of failing to include a different voice. But it's when we look at our elected representatives that we can see these numbers even clearer. These are people on whom we rely to make laws that protect us and not cater to populism and to make laws that will have ramifications for now, for society now and in the future, especially in the absence of a Human Rights Act. In fact, some people argue that Human Rights Act would give too much power to courts as they believe that parliamentarians should make and unmake these laws. So 25% of people identify as people of colour, yet in the 151 elected House of Representatives, only eight fall into this category, which is actually evenly spread around, um, among Labour and Liberal. Eight out of 151 is 5%. Now, it may well be that people of colour are simply not interested in public office, or it may be that there's just simply no one qualified amongst the, the people of colour communities, although seeing the behaviour of many of the current groups over the recent years, that can hardly be an excuse. But the end result is that a significant number of Australians do not necessarily feel represented by any of the gov recent governments. 
So like in many countries around the world who have a two-party system, we look to our centre-left party for answers. After all, some of the most pivotal, monumental moments in advancing racial equality has come from the Australian Labour Party in recent history and its leaders. Although the last really such great moment was 13 years ago with Kevin Rudd's apology to the stolen generation. Last year I was in the US during the federal election primaries at a time when there were 22 candidates who were um, Democrats, so Democrat primaries. Now at that stage there were 22 candidates who were all announcing their election promises. And every single one of them condemned Trump's new border policies loudly and clearly. Many used very colourful language to describe Trump, language that would be hard to imagine any opposition in Australia condemning such a populist and a divisive cause. And perhaps this persistent vocal denunciation of racial policies, racist policies, explains why in the USA people of colour overwhelmingly vote Democrat over Republican. The figure is around African Americans, 80, 80 to 90 percent vote Democrat, um, whereas less than 8 percent vote Republican, and amongst the Hispanics, 70 percent vote Democrat and less than 20 percent Republican. And it's especially interesting given that both of these groups have a documented higher level of socially conservative values than the broader American community. So being more likely to oppose issues like same-sex marriage and abortion and other pillars of Democrat policies. Yet the vocal stance of the Democrats that they've taken against racism, while having its own obvious flaws of course, overrides religious, traditional and personal values. Now in Australia, however, the situation differs markedly with numbers ranging from about 50-50 to a slight preponderance for people of colour to vote for the conservative side of politics. Well, why shouldn't they if they do not see a great difference in racial issues being addressed? In fact, the only significant time that I recall a blatantly racist campaign potentially influencing people, color, people of colour in an election was in um, 2007 when John Howard lost his seat in Bedlam. But essentially, most people don't see any great difference between the two parties in Australia on this issue, which is a shame. Without a much more forceful check, check by the centre-left of politics, we see conservative voices running unchecked with current calls by our now Prime Minister for asylum seekers to be officially referred to as illegal. And his other recent statement that there was no slavery in Australia. In the meantime, the Labour Party will condemn such statements, but when pressed, they will blame Chinese PhD students for housing problems or whitewash any election material of people of any racial diversity. And the union attacks, uh, especially in Western Australia in the last few years, and 457 visa holders pitting local workers against the foreign born reminds us that some things may not really have changed over the last century. Any Human Rights Act needs to not only be passed in Parliament, but also accepted and understood and, dare we hope, embraced by the wider community. Failure to do the latter will have little difference and these George Floyd moments can continue to, to flourish, whether there's an act or no act. Ensuring that these rights get upheld at the local level means education, publicly funded campaigns and a lot of effort, but above all, it needs an honest discussion of what led us to this unusual situation in the first place. This situation is both way out of step with the rest of the world, as well as with the way we approach and have had tremendous success in so many other areas of human rights. Now, racial inclusivity and ending racial discrimination is clearly not the only area that needs strengthening in any Human Rights Act. But as the standout area of our failings, it's an important place to start. And we need to constantly hold our elected representatives accountable, irrespective of how we might feel about their stance and views on other issues, to stop normalising this as part of the Australian ethos. And when these values are documented and enacted in a Human Rights Act, we can all as Australians take ownership of it. We're not uh, going to ask for donations um, tonight because we're so pleased to see everyone back. But it is um, $40 for every mask that you take over there. No, it's not. The masks are free. If you feel that you want to put on a mask, then just take one and put them on. We're going to have to get through them. There are 50 there, so um, there's plenty. And uh, thank you for coming.
All right. Um, we're going to have like 15 minutes each. Uh, welcome, Frank, everyone, Jeff. And uh, yes, I'll introduce Dr. Barry. I'll introduce both at once, and then, I'll sh then I can sort of shut up and, and get on with it. Uh, Dr. Barry Fatherford is, well, she's probably a musician, but um, uh, 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 Rose Bay general practitioner and uh, president of the uh, uh, Doctors for Refugees, uh, which was founded in 2013 after the revelations about Manus and how the, the, the ma mis ma medical mismanagement and, and there. Uh, I think you told me there are eight doctors involved, seriously involved in, is that right? Or yeah, there? about that any one time, looking at medical records, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, say more. Um, so, and uh, with a fantastic website, oh yes, and uh, politics should never, politics should never compromise healthcare, which is sort of, it's been killing people lately. Um, so that's, a, that, that's from the website, politics should never compromise healthcare. Uh, so that's a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing on the website. And uh, from a personal point of view, I watched this film, um, against our oath about doctors under terrible regimes. And uh, th then we have this one, and it's filmed seem to be like a series of hapless doctors individually confronting this wretched um, phalanx of Nazis out of uniform. That's my way of looking at it. Of, of these people from the immigration department and so on, um, being extremely coercive. And these doctor, doctors singly and individually trying to confront them. And what I think is fantastic is that Dr. Barry is the first person to get the bloody doctors together and, and face, face them off, face them down. So uh, the guts and the gumption to do that. So I think that's, that's remarkable in itself and, and uh, very much needed. So. Um, and David Shoebridge is, uh, well, neither Peter person needs any really much introduction, but um, uh, you're, you're like, Lee Rian, like Lee Rhiannon, you're just always there, uh, you know, when you're asked to be there, you know, we, we want someone a, a bit credible to speak. A bit uh, credible. To, to, make, to, to make us look not like a bunch of uh, misfits. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, the answer's nearly always yes, and it's always favourable, and it's always great. And uh, former barrister, uh, I can't read my own writing, uh, m member of, a green member of the New South Wales Legislative Council since September 2010. You live in Wallara, and uh, sounds like this is your life, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and this is your former what, no. Um, uh, what else am I going to say? Um, Yes, and, and you, you had a recent thing with, which we were talking about earlier with, with a, a former staffer, which you've admirably stood by her. And uh, so, uh, look, it's wonderful. To, it's like it's just it's difficult to, to, to sort of introduce people you personally really admire. It sounds a bit like, but yeah. So it's really wonderful to have you here both speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, I told you about the mouse, didn't I? Yes. Shut up, Stephen. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past and present. So we saw, we're talking tonight about the urgent need for a Human Rights Act. So the first thing we need to ask is, what is a Human Rights Act? Well, there are many definitions of human rights, so it's probably easiest to look at what was contained at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Now the range of rights that were included in this document were civil and political rights such as the right to be able to vote and to a fair trial, economic and social rights including health and education, the rights of the child, ending discrimination against women and racial and ethnic minorities, freedom from torture and other cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment and a host of others. Now these ideas obviously didn't just emerge in the middle of the last century and generally they've had their basis in many of the world's great religions. 
as well as from philosophers through the ages. Although tragically after World War II, the world needed reminding of fundamental ethics, and so these were ratified into the one document. Australia is one of the founding countries that have signed up to this, but signing up to this is not enforceable in our domestic law. And so all the UN member states need to enact their own document, the Charter or an Act. Australia is the only Western liberal democracy to not have our own Human Rights Act, with countries with similar systems of government like the UK, USA, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa all having one. So why does Australia not have one and what does this mean? So looking at the second question first, we can examine the current status of Australia's human rights according to the United Nations. The Universal Periodic Review, or UPR, is the UN Human Rights Council which records, which records the human rights record of each UN member state every five years over a broad range of international human rights obligations. So how did we do? Generally speaking, for workers' rights, we're really quite high. In terms of uh, preventing and eliminating discrimination against women, we're also comparatively high, although we were somewhat late coming to parentally and our gender pay gap has fluctuated in the last decade. Regarding LGBT, we've recently come up quite dramatically to speed, but even prior to the same-sex marriage law, we had several parameters that still fell quite into the high compliance category. Australia has one of the highest, highest scores in terms of access to healthcare, uh, for relative freedom of religion, disability services and other welfare benefits and we also sit amongst very high scores elsewhere in a wide range of parameters. So, on the surface of it, it can hardly seem the need for a Human Rights Act, and certainly opponents of the Human Rights Act would say as much. But then we look at the two areas that were highlighted by the UPR, which is indefinite detention of asylum seekers, and the shocking levels of incarceration of the Indigenous community, and we realise that we actually do have significant failings. During one such UPR assessment at the 2015 UN summit in Geneva, 110 countries, which is more than half of the countries of the UN, made 300 recommendations for Australia to improve our human rights record. And because of the large number of countries who specifically wanted to comment on Australia, each nation had only 65 seconds in which to address Australia's human rights regime overwhelmingly about these two issues. Our treatment of the Indigenous community and that of asylum seekers. Now that Australia's Indigenous population is the highest single group incarceration in the world is an absolute source of shame. And so too our policy of mandatory detention of asylum seekers, which first began in 1992 under the Keating government, and has been out of step with the rest of the world, with the rest of the world ever since. Ever since this time, there have been demonstrations, there have been legal challenges, protests, and even millions of dollars paid by federal, successive federal governments in compensation. From as far back as 20 years ago, the government was ordered to pay a then record of around $400,000, plus over $1 million for the legal fees, for a family of a six-year-old boy who was found to be traumatised in detention, to the point where Minister, then Immigration Minister Ruddock apparently wrote Buckley's on his file in response to a question as to his chance of recovery. And this notation was submitted in evidence in the court case. As recently as 2017, the federal government was forced to pay a total of $75 million to a group of men on that asylum. Now these are Australian courts that have made these determinations. So Australian policies, certainly as they pertain to asylum seekers, and quite probably in many more cases, effectively violate even Australia's own laws, which is clearly an absurd situation. And one that can be neatly rectified in Parliament by enacting new laws that make the objectionable treatment suddenly legal. Now, with all these human rights violations being widespread, would a hum in Australia, would a Human Rights Act prevent this? We've seen cases of police, police brutality against African Americans, and yet, US has a Bill of Rights. So how much does legislation control for bad behaviour and racist attitudes? 
Now, David, who's speaking next, is in a far better position than myself to comment on this. But it's clear that having a background of standard basic rights to which all new legislation, court judgment, police action, and all other agencies are filtered can only be of benefit. So we therefore need to change at the community attitudes, the community level, our attitudes as well. To do this, we need to critically look at how we got to this place and work through any discomfort it may bring. It's well known that one of the newly federated Australia's first acts was the Immigration Restriction Act, also known as the White Australia Policy. And equally, that this was brought in by the precursor to the current Labor Party, which was then made up largely of trade unionists. As a result, Australia's new economy had, and that still continues to have, some of the most enviable workplace conditions in the world. These achievements have combined to ensure that not only a high minimum wage, safety at the work site, sick leave, penalty rates, functioning work cover program, as well as unemployment benefits, disability benefits, single parent allowance, age pensions, and so much more. And that many of these can effectively continue for our entire life is unheard of in many other countries in the developed world. Now, clearly we can't declare the industrial relations battle won, and nor can we be complacent that changes won't start getting eroded by stealth any time in the future, as we've seen them happen recently. But we also can't continue to deny that the social makeup and diversity of Australia has changed considerably since the beginning of the 20th century. Now, at a time, 100 years ago, when there was no regard for the indigenous community who were routinely enslaved, forcibly separated from family and denied basic forms of justice. No concern to migrant workers who, despite forming families, having children here, were not permitted to stay, live or become a citizen. Scant regard for women who had little financial independence and, base, and, and virtually no pro provisions for those with disability and, of course, homosexuality was, was illegal anyway. Now, in this time, the working class white male may well have appeared the most disenfranchised of the already relatively enfranchised group, and so priority their needs likely made sense for a coordinated movement across against the establishment. The problem is now, when we continue this decades later, to the exclusion of acknowledging or addressing other systemic injustices that, in fact, may well be impacted even further by one group's gains. Essentially, exploding the myth that we need to compete against each other for finite resources. Currently, the proportion of people in Australia who identify as non-white is around 25%. Now, this figure comes from um, a report by the Australian Human Rights Commission in 2018 called Leading for Change. And it's based on the 2016 census figures, but the census figures themselves don't break down by race. So it can be hard to get exact numbers and people can, in fact, nominate more than one ancestry. But in any event, it seems odd to have such a high figure, one in four, when representations all around us in the media, in senior manager, managerials and CEO and other positions seem so starkly white. And although, although there has been a noticeable shift in recent years. In countries such as the USA, Canada, New Zealand and UK, it's common to see representations of racial diversity um, as TV hosts or panellists, whereas in Australia, it's uh, an unfortunately regular occurrence to see four white spokesperson on any morning show discussing racial issues, seemingly blithely unconscious to the irony of failing to include a different voice. But it's when we look at our elected representatives that we can see these numbers even clearer. These are people on whom we rely to make laws that protect us and not cater to populism and to make laws that will have ramifications for now, for society now and in the future, especially in the absence of a Human Rights Act. In fact, some people argue that Human Rights Act would give too much power to courts as they believe that parliamentarians should make and unmake these laws. So 25% of people identify as people of colour, yet in the 151 elected House of Representatives, only eight fall into this category which is actually evenly spread around um, among Labour and Liberal. Eight out of 151 is 5%. Now, it may well be that people of colour are simply not interested in public office, or it may be that there is just simply no one qualified amongst the, the people of colour communities, 
Although seeing the behaviour of many of the current groups over the recent years, that can hardly be an excuse. But the end result is that a significant number of Australians do not necessarily feel represented by any of the gov recent governments. So like in many countries around the world who have a two-party system, we look to our centre-left party for answers. After all, some of the most pivotal, monumental moments in advancing racial equality has come from the Australian Labor Party in recent history and its leaders. Although the last really such great moment was 13 years ago with Kevin Rudd's apology to the stolen generation. Last year I was in the US during the federal election primaries at a time when there were 22 candidates who were um, Democrats, so the Democrat primaries. And at that stage there were 22 candidates who were all announcing their election promises. And every single one of them condemned Trump's new border policies loudly and clearly. Many used very colourful language to describe Trump, language that would be hard to imagine any opposition in Australia condemning such a populist and a divisive cause. And perhaps this persistent vocal denunciation of racial policies, racist policies, explains why in the USA people of colour overwhelmingly vote Democrat over Republican. The figure is around African Americans, 80, 80 to 90% vote Democrat, um, whereas less than 8% Repu vote Republican, and amongst the Hispanics, 70% vote Democrat and less than 20% Republican. And it's especially interesting, given that both of these groups have a documented higher level of socially conservative values than the broader American community. So being more likely to oppose issues like same-sex marriage and abortion, and other pillars of Democrat policies. Yet the vocal stance of the Democrats that they've taken against racism, while having its own obvious flaws, of course, overrides religious, traditional and personal values. Now in Australia, however, the situation differs markedly, with numbers ranging from about 50-50 to a slight preponderance for people of colour to vote for the conservative side of politics. Well, why shouldn't they, if they do not see a great difference in racial issues being addressed? In fact, the only significant time that I recall a blatantly racist campaign potentially influencing people, color, people of colour in an election was in um, 2007 when John Howard lost his seat in Bedalong. But essentially most people don't see any great difference between the two parties in Australia on this issue, which is a shame. Without a much more forceful check, check by the centre-left of politics, we see conservative voices running unchecked with current calls by our now Prime Minister for asylum seekers to be officially referred to as illegal. And his other recent statement that there was no slavery in Australia. In the meantime, the Labour Party will condemn such statements, but when pressed, they will blame Chinese PhD students for housing problems or whitewashing the election material of people of any racial diversity. And the union attacks, uh, especially in Western Australia in the last few years, and 457 visa holders pitting local workers against the foreign bull reminds us that some things may not really have changed over the last century. Any Human Rights Act needs to not only be passed in Parliament, but also accepted and understood and, dare we hope, embraced by the wider community. Failure to do the latter will have little difference and these George Floyd moments can continue to, to flourish, whether there's an act or no act. Ensuring that these rights get upheld at the local level means education, publicly funded campaigns and a lot of effort. But above all, it needs an honest discussion of what led us to this unusual situation in the first place. This situation is both way out of step with the rest of the world, as well as with the way we approach and have had tremendous success in so many other areas of human rights. Now, racial inclusivity and ending racial discrimination is clearly not the only area that needs strengthening in any Human Rights Act. But as the standout area of our failings, it's an important place to start. And we need to constantly hold our elected representatives accountable, irrespective of how we might feel about their stance and views on other issues, to stop normalising this as part of the Australian ethos. And when these values are documented and enacted in a Human Rights Act, we can all as Australians take ownership of it.
different than the hotel, it's just the way it is. It's fine. All right. Um, oh, I, I particularly want to thank Barry for that. Um, I thought really carefully um, and, and very well constructed philosophical argument and moral argument for why we need a, um, a Human Rights Act. And uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the, the, this institution that we're in. The institution that I'm a part of, the New South Wales Parliament, is on Gadigal land and pay my respects to those elders past, present and emerging. And um, speaking as I do as a, a member of the New South Wales Parliament, I also want to acknowledge just how complicit the institution I'm, I'm a part of has been in dispossession and violence against First Nations peoples. And um, I think Stephen at some point said that, you know, MPs bring some credibility, I think he said a very modest amount of credibility, but some credibility to, um, um, to discussions and to um, protests and to community actions. But we also bring with us that, that ongoing um, abuse of power and authority against marginalised groups. And, and there is no more marginalised group or oppressed group in, in, in their own country than First Nations people. So I start with that acknowledgement. Um, so do we need a Human Rights Act? Well, well yes, of course we do. Um, uh, I think probably my only argument against a Human Rights Act is uh, a Human Rights Act, of course, is, is, is slightly less than what I think we really need which is entrenched constitutional rights rather than just legislative rights. Because remember, any legislation that one parliament gives, the next parliament can just rub it out at some point. But in, if you entrench something in the constitution, well then, you know, that requires, you know, a majority of people in a majority of states to, um, to remove it and rub it out. So um, yes, I do think we need a Human Rights Act. Yes, I think we need one at a federal level. Um, but I believe we also need ones at, at every state level. And I think we st need to start building a human rights architecture across the country. Um, but, but as Barry says, um, you know, you can look at plenty of countries around the world that have wonderful constitutional rights, you know, or in the United States, you know, we, we see entrenched constitutional rights that are meant to prohibit, you know, arbitrary arrest, that are meant to stop search and seizures arbitrary search and seizures. But of course, rights can exist over here in a legal or constitutional framework, but then the lived experience of particularly people with, without economic or social power can be quite distinct from what their technical legal rights are. And it's bridging those two things that I think is a real challenge. So may, maybe I'll just give a little summary about where we're at at a nation in terms of our human rights infrastructure. So um, uh, starting at a federal level, well, there is no Bill of Rights, so there's nothing entrenched in the Constitution. But it turns out if you, on a very dark night, you take the Constitution out and you read it by candlelight and you look at it from an odd angle, you can actually imply a couple of, well, one, at least one constitutional right into the Constitution. It's not there in black and white, but you can imply it on a dark, stormy night with a bottle of fire open. And, um, and if you look at it in that light, you can see that there is at least a, an implied limitation on the ability of any level of government, local, state or federal, to um, crack down on political communication. So it's not a right, none of us have a right to political communication under that, um, under, under that case law which has been now developed by the High Court. So it's not, it's not actually a right, but it's an implied limitation on what any government can do to stop political communication. How did we get that wonderful right? Um, well, of course, we got it because a bunch of cashed up um, uh, news outlets, um, especially um, television outlets in the 1980s, ran constitutional cases to prohibit the federal government from restricting paid political advertising in the lead up to election campaigns. So it's a pretty ignoble pathway which we got the, um, the implied limitation, but that's the one constitutional limitation we have. We've seen it applied repeatedly since then um, in some individual cases, um, including cases run by the likes of Bob Brown in Tasmania. But we also saw it strike down some very undemocratic um, legislation in the New South Wales Parliament that tried to prohibit unions from donating to political causes. Um, so it has, it has some utility, but it's not really a right. It's just a, a limitation on what governments can do. And it doesn't say they can't restrict political communication 
that just says they can't unreasonably restrict political communication and anything they do has to be for a legitimate purpose. So there's that one constitutional right. So you can all go home tonight warm and safe in the, in the, in the comfort that our, consti our federal constitution gives us that wonderful protection. There's nothing though to stop arbitrary arrest. You know, there's nothing to stop prolonged detention without charge. There's nothing like that in, in our federal constitution. And at a state level, there's literally nothing in the constitution. There's nothing at all um, that, that, that gives us any rights. Um, what we have seen in the ACT and Victoria is a very pared down human rights model, which sets out um, a series of um, uh, legislative protections for human rights, um, and then says that any act passed by the ACT legislature or the Victorian parliament, any act should, so far as possible, be read consistent with those human rights frameworks. But then it also says um, that if either of those legislatures, either the ACT or the Victorian legislature, choose to, they can at any point override those, um, those protections contained in the ACT um, or the Victorian model. But, you know, the reports from those jurisdictions are that in the, you know, five to ten years since they've been enacted, um, it has produced some positive change in the way the legislature operates in those two jurisdictions. Because whenever legislation is presented to the Parliament um, or the Assembly in the ACT that um, impacts upon human rights, there needs to be a certificate issued by the Attorney General or the respective Minister that says that the legislation does not breach the Human Rights Acts or bills in those, in those jurisdictions. And then if it or if it does breach it, it gives an explanation for why and how and why it's reasonable. And apparently that has changed some of the, the thinking in the bureaucracies and, um, and the departments that, that you know, feed, feed acts, of, acts and bills into the parliamentary machine. So um, I'm happy to take a question now if you like, or we can... So, so that's the rights framework that we have. Basically nothing in New South Wales, basically nothing federally, some very limited, largely civil and political rights regimes in the ACT and Victoria. None of them provide economic rights or economic protections. Attached to, in addition to that, we have some piecemeal and quite dysfunctional legislation at a state and a federal level that prohibits certain forms of discrimination. Um, whether it's racial discrimination or discrimination on the basis of gender um, or sexuality, but it, that's a very that's very patchwork. That legislation again, it's able to be um, repealed at will or limited at will by any state or federal um, um, legislature, um, and it's also um, I've got to say extre extremely complicated. Much of it's not fit for purpose. Thank you, both of the speakers. Mm. Process for moving towards the Bill of Rights, it came to nothing. 
So my first question is, is, is the more scope at the state level for making progress <coughs> than at the federal level? Uh, and, and the second question is, I suppose, how would that in any case impact on the material conditions of disadvantage for Indigenous Australians? It wouldn't in and of itself close the gap, it wouldn't in and of itself reduce incarceration rates for, for young Indigenous people, uh, what traction <coughs> would that actually have um, in terms of resolving the material issues where, where the tyre hits the road? Um, I'm going to take this one, I'll give you the Thanks, Frank. Um, with respect to where can we go and what can we do, and I did want to hear from David because I wanted to find out about how the, I know Andrew Wilkie has put up a, a bill at least once or twice in Parliament to have a Human Rights Act, and I'd really like to hear um, from a parliamentarian how that's progressed. With regarding refugee rights, there's pretty much very little that we can do when both parties are in lockstep over this. And we have made appeals to the International Criminal Court. Andrew Wilkie has also made appeals to the International Criminal Court. And Stanford University has also done the bulk of that. The issue is, is that Australia, and this is speaking only with the refugee issue, while Australia has punitive, draconian and clearly violating of human rights treatment with refugees in the offshore, onshore um, and elsewhere in the community, Australia has a terrific record with taking um, the, one of 43 countries that takes a reasonable amount of refugees from the UNHCR camps. So essentially the um, argument that ICC or any of the other international bodies considers is, well, you know, can they torture a few given they've been so terrific to refugees on every other level? And clearly at one point some organisations have decided yes. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to, to David to talk about the laws. Sure. Uh, th there's no pathway I see at a state level with the current government. They will have zero appetite for any of these kinds of discussions. I told you about the joys of the Legislative Review Committee and that's kind of reflected in their thinking. You know, they, they're just not, they don't operate in a human rights framework. Um, if you wanted me to give you another reason why, our current police minister is a guy called David Elliott. Um, he's just like a, he's just like, he, he has, uh, well, I think he's a genuine liability as a police minister. He's currently being investigated for a major firearms offence when he went firing off a submachine gun without authority. Um, he's been engaged in road rage and allegations of assault. Um, and he's the police minister, you know, and he's left there by the Premier. And it's kind of a statement, really, about the, 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 the very sort of political views about rights or a rights-based framework. Um, would it make a difference? Well, I, I've got to say, I think right, where the debate is right now, you know, in July 2020, the debate isn't about a Human Rights Act. The debate now is about these series of demands that are coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement that I think probably would make much more material difference to the lives, particularly of our First Nations peoples in this country, um, than, than a Human Rights Act. And I'd urge you to have a look at the, the, the six-point reform agenda that's been put out under the Black Lives Matter movement by Jumbana Indigenous House of Learning, for example, um, headed by Larissa Berent over there at UTS. And they've got a six-point reform agenda under the Black Lives Matter movement that I think, if that was implemented, would deliver you know, substantially more immediate real benefits, particularly to First Nations peoples, than a sort of more abstract human rights act. But that being said, you know, that agenda <coughs> is advanced when you make it clear to people that Australia is an outlier here as an advanced liberal democracy without a human rights act. And that means all of those reform agendas in the Black Lives Matter movement are actually much more critical and more pressing, whether that's proper oversight of debts in custody whether that's producing something that I think would be groundbreaking and we've never seen anywhere else in the world, which would be a de-incarceration commission. So we actually create a statutory commission to actually remove First Nations peoples from jails. I mean, that would be an extraordinary achievement if we could achieve that. Um, or we could um, legislate to stop uh, First Nations kids 
and Aboriginal kids being stolen by the state. And they're being stolen by the state at the moment at five times the rate they were when the Bringing Them Home report was produced in 1997. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Australians, even if we manage to educate the majority of Australians that the stolen generations is a current issue, not a thing of the past. Those are the kinds of demands in the Black Lives Matter movement. And I've got to say, I think they, collectively, if we achieve those, would achieve a, the, the kind of change in material conditions um, um, that I think many of us were asking for. But if we want to entrench that and ensure those changes have longevity, they should be married with the Human Rights Act. Mm. Internationally, um, our labour laws are regarded as pretty good yeah. because there's next to no right to strike even, and um, there are lots of restraints on trade unions, no right of entry into workplaces. So, so that does surprise me a bit. And um, I, I, I was pleased to hear what they said about the possibilities of a Human Rights Act as opposed to entrenching in the Constitution. How would we stop it being turned over? by subsequent governments? How would we ensure that enough funding was there to um, um, implement it? Do you want to go first, Mary? Can you go first? You can go first. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I think probably um, the, the truth of any kind of political achievement is um, it only has the longevity that you give it. You know, if you entrench a right, remains there whilst ever you're committed to protecting it and defending that right. Um, if, if we get legislative wins, they remain for as long as we collectively keep the legislature on track. And, you know, we've seen that time after time. You get a win and then it's lost by the next incoming government. And I don't have an answer to that other than constantly engaging in politics and keeping the bastards honest and keeping, um, you know, continuing to build social movements that actually hold politicians to account. You know, we, we could digress and talk about how we actually need to change our deeply undemocratic, notionally um, democratic electoral system, and I think we should. Um, how we should devolve power down to communities rather than just leave it all in, in parliaments. Um, but, you know, the, these rights, if you entrench them in statute, are only going to last as long as those norms remain in parliament. And that's partly why I think Barry's observations about what's so broken federally you don't have anyone challenging those norms of brutality against refugees federally. You know, you have the Greens challenging them. Um, but, but between the, the Coalition and Labor, you know, you've got 80% of the, the, the Parliament never even challenging this sort of systemic, routine brutality. And that becomes a political norm. Labor established a political norm. It's been built on and grown by the Coalition. And that's why, you know, when we see those political norms being established, that's why we, we need to, you know, at that moment, aggressively, you know, campaign against them. And when we establish a good norm, we have to maintain it. Thanks. Yes, there's certainly, um, there's certainly uh, room to move and for improvement when it comes to workplace rights. And, and we also can't take, afford to take our eye off the ball, given the way that rights can be wound down. Having said that, these were the results of the... Um, the, the periodic review. So no one, I, I don't think they said that we were exceptionally high up, like we have been with things like healthcare and long-term welfare benefits, but comparatively we score highly on workplace, um, work, workplace rights and pretty much every other parameter except for those two that I mentioned, Indigenous and refugee health. The third one that has been mentioned is our really alarming rates of domestic violence and people are often surprised about it thinking that what well, the level we experience now is reflected elsewhere in comparable countries like we you know like those of western europe north america and the uk that's not the case at all and one right that we're finding that's been progressively slipping is uh freedom of the press has um, slipped down as well recently David, you spoke on this story, and I want to follow up on what you said. I'm ashamed to be an Australian. I'm ashamed to be an Australian after the Black Lives Matter issue came out, and they mentioned that there are 
how many uh, aborigines that were uh, denied justice or 433, and yeah. the people and the blacks that were killed in jail. I'm ashamed that that just came out and nothing is happening. What the hell is wrong with us as citizens that we aren't demanding more action? The second thing I want to raise with you is that poor families from Queensland, I think they're Sri Lankan or Indian, who are in Christmas Island. What the heck have they done to deserve that? They're a good family, hardworking family. Why, what the hell are their rights? Pardon my language. Um, the, um, the detention of that family and the brutality to the kids in particular, but not just kids, parents and the like, um, it does stagger you that, 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 that we have a political system that says, do you know what, we are going to deliberately harm this child. And we know we're going to harm the child. There's report after report that says major psychological damage, major long-term damage. And, and, and there's a deliberate policy of harming that child, notionally to deter other people from um, seeking to obtain asylum. And when you have a political system that signs off on that, like the intentional, deliberate causing of harm to a child as a deterrent effect, well, I think it does say something about our federal politics and it says that they're, they're at a, a kind of deep moral low. And that, you know, there are plenty of philosophical um, 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 theories, uh, theorists that would call out that kind of political matrix as being inherently abusive, and it is. Um, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, well, look, I mean, I um, I got censured by the New South Wales Parliament, um, which the effect of that is that I've lost my state of having not been censured. So that's the effect of being censured. <laughs> Previously, I had I was I was in a state of not being censured, and now I'm in a state of having been censured. So that's the that's the effect of being censured by the New South Wales Parliament. But I was censured by them because one of my staff members went up and um, um, did some political um, uh, graffiti on on a statue in Sydney, and I didn't sack her or condemn her. And also, I went and I campaigned with the Gumbanya people on the mid north coast when they asked me to come up and campaign with them to stop their their forest and their sacred sites and their song lines being destroyed by industrial logging, uh, even though that wasn't in breach of any of the public health um, um, uh, laws. Apparently, m me doing that with Aboriginal people was somehow politically offensive because um, because of COVID-19 issues. Um, it was a socially distanced, very respectful event. Um, anyhow, so they censured me, but I've got to say that that gave me an opportunity to say what I thought of them in the parliamentary chamber and say that I thought. You know, and on that day, they must have put on five separate motions talking about how important it was to protect statues uh, in one form or another, but not a single motion about protecting Aboriginal kids or protecting, you know, Aboriginal women or reversing the, 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 the shameful incarceration rates that we have of First Nations people. So I got the opportunity to say that. And in fact, uh, after my contribution and the, the, the chamber, the tone of the chamber changed. And I think there was a, at least for a little while, a collective acknowledgement in the chamber that their, their, their nasty partisan political focus was, was, was serving a gross in disservice to the people of New South Wales and to the fundamental issue of First Nations um, incarceration and, and, and dispossession. And there was a kind of awkwardness in the chamber that proceeded over that day and the following day. And in fact, the following day, I, I got a motion up to establish uh, an inquiry into how we oversight deaths in custody. And, and the first term of that inquiry acknowledged the gross over-representation of First Nations peoples in our prisons. And we now have a cross-party uh, committee that's actually investigating the, the appallingly patchwork and incoherent way in which we oversight deaths in custody. And the figure you were looking for was some 434 deaths in custody, so it may be 435, um, since the Royal Commission um, that we had into Aboriginal deaths in custody. So, um, something good came of it. That committee is now open for submissions and I think I would encourage people to put submissions in about how we oversight um, our prisons to ensure that you know, the staggeringly dreadful rate of First Nations deaths in custody are not, are not repeated. Thanks. Yeah, the um, Bill Wheeler family is, is a tragedy and like them there are so many other people who have lost their lives, they've lost their livelihoods, they've lost their mind. And if they ever do end up released, there are um, numerous psychiatric surveys and studies that indicate their chance of having a functioning life 
obviously deteriorates the longer they're kept in such conditions. They've watched people, close friends of theirs die, friends of theirs suicide. There, there's really nothing that this um, indefinite detention, offshore detention, any aspect of that regime that really has any redeeming features. In around, I think it was 2014, but I could be wrong, it was when there was the Human Rights Commission Forgotten Children report, and there was the Immigration Minister, Scott Morrison, and the Shadow Spokesperson for Labour, Chris Bowen. Both of them admitted under oath that locking up children has no preventative or deterrent method, measures to preventing votes coming in. They both had to admit that on oath. So while I may go to Sky News or Channel 9 or wherever and say the complete opposite, they were both forced to, co to concede under oath, Labour and Liberal, that this has no deterrence efforts. So we know that it's purely electoral. And when you've got both parties in lockstep, it's very hard to, to see any headway forward. The Black Lives Matter movement is, is what's so fascinating in the moment because that's that other aspect that we were talking about earlier with legislating for change, um, enshrining an act and making sure that public um, attitudes are affected or at least talking about the subject. Not everyone who sees the Black Lives Matter movement is going to get up and go, isn't this great, but it's at least going to bring up the conversation. And that is a major obstacle uh, in our progress to getting any sort of racial harmony, but even before then even acknowledging that, that there is a problem. Like I said, when you have the four white panellists on any of those morning radios talking about morning TV, talking about something as relatively inconsequential to the average Australian's way of life, which is, should we change the day for Australia Day? We get a whole range of reasons such as why should I change? Why should I give up something? This is, there's a historical reason why we have it on this day and all manner of really dubious historical claims coming to it. And then they'll start talking about, well, what about domestic violence in Alice Springs? I mean, there's essentially a whole range of reasons why they don't even consider including the conversation of people of colour and in this case of the indigenous community into that. So while we do not accept that we have a need to have this discussion and we have a need to listen to the voices of the people that are being impacted, that's going to be our main, um, our, our main obstacle in going forward. So that's why the Black Lives Matter movement right now is why there's the urgency amongst this. Thank you for your talk, Larry and David. And uh, I'd like to just point out that there is a human being that has that enjoys tremendous rights in Australia, probably around the world. And Dr. Pat Reynolds will probably confirm this. It's a corporation. <laughs> when you look at legislations, regulations, favoring corporations over human beings because they are actually treated as human beings. There is something seriously wrong in the framework of legislation and regulation and governance. So my question goes straight to the point is, how will a Bill of Rights help human beings like myself, like everyone in this room, enjoy more rights than the corporations? Because we need to define what the human being is before we grant human rights. That's my question. Um. <clears throat> Well, I mean, clearly a Human Rights Act would exclude, would, wouldn't provide rights to corporations. But, I mean, we've seen some deeply troubling um, precedents in the United States under their Bill of Rights, where the right for free speech is actually associated with um, corporate rights to spend as much as they like to corrupt political processes in the United States. Um, and I think I said to you at the, in, in, my, in my contribution that, in fact, the way we got the one implied limitation on um, constitutional limitation on the actions of federal, state, or local M, uh, governments to 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 impinge upon our political communication was by a very well cashed up um, case from the major media outlets to stop the then federal Labor government from putting a cap and a prohibition on paid TV ads in the lead up to federal elections. 
um, and, and that was a very well you know, funded constitutional challenge by Channel 7 and Channel 9 and, and, and PACA. And, um, and, and that's how we got our one implied constitutional right of sorts in the federal. So, um, so, so I, I do think one of the, one of the other benefits of, of the Human Rights Act is hopefully rebalancing some of the rights between actual natural persons and corporates. Um, because one of the great problems with corporations is they don't die um, unless they go into liquidation and they just keep accruing wealth and accruing power. And, and, you know, they never have that moment where they die and hand it on unless they go into liquidation or the like. And, and I think that is really problematic. Um, and, but that's, you won't address that through human rights bill. Thanks. Sorry. sorry. Uh, I don't have a lot to add to that. I mean, I don't have a lot of expertise in the area of corporation law. But um, I will say, sort of slightly tangential to what you were saying, is this idea of competing rights. And that will certainly impact on the rights of a corporation um, versus the rights of an individual. But it'll, we're also seeing that play out now in things like when in Melbourne, when they're locking people up in these towers, the, the thousands of people that are locked up in the North Melbourne Towers. now. Those people who also happen to be largely of a lower income level and of a high, mig high level of uh, a migrant background and a whole range of other people with certain disadvantages, they seem to be disproportionately impacted. But then again, we've got the state telling us that that is the right of the general state. So there are always going to be competing rights that need to be addressed. Um, but I think also having, having that thought out, having all the interest groups and stakeholders and everyone helping to formulate that, uh, such a document already provides a basis when looking and seeing when unusual situations like a global pandemic outbreaking in a low income housing block does arise. Which is why collective rights are essential too. Uh, and, and we should talk about collective rights rather than just individual rights, you know. And, and, and indeed the right to health, and the right to health care, and the right to sick leave. So as, you know, you can actually, if you're, if you're sick and you're worried about going to work, you, you can have the right to have paid sick leave. There's a whole lot of protective rights that, even if they're given to individuals, provide collective protection. Um, and, and I think talking about collective rights as well is, is a good corrective. the crowd that's here tonight, uh, long-standing human rights activists and all that, and say that although it's a liberal bourgeois right by Rousseau when he said, I don't agree with what you say, I'll defend to the end your right to say it, if it was Rousseau. Um, I think the big problem with politics in the pub at the moment is it just is really a Stephen Langford head nodding session. I agree with everything that you say. We don't tackle the hard issues. The hard issue at the moment is woke culture. It's the refusal of the left liberals and the left to examine the effects of uh, what the conservatives say about the left walking through the institutions from the 60s. And by this I mean we don't pull apart people like, things like Mark Latham's speech to the New South Wales Parliament about the anti-discrimination board last year, we just dismiss it and say, oh, he's a right winger, he's a Pauline Hansonite, therefore we won't even look at it. Now, as much as I admire all the work done by the two speakers, particularly, uh, well, both speakers, um, David, uh, I found it, when I found out recently, particularly annoying that one of your advisors into the question of uh, uh, the sexual harassment, paedophilia, homosexual debate that went on in state parliament was Gary Nichols, 
who took on 200 individual actions to persecute sorry, religious sorry. and conservative Gary opponents. Nichols, Gary Nichols has never worked yeah. for me. He's not one of my advisors. Well, I don't know where you get that bizarre thing. It's just well, bizarre. Yeah, well, it's okay. a bizarre. I said I'll defend to the end your right to speak. Let me say that woke culture is being used by the conservatives to bash our position out of the court at the moment because we're not addressing it. The, 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 the use of public bureaucracies and uh, Black Lives Matter and all the other progressive things that we fought for. But over the last 50 years, I was on the other side of the 4,000 women who went into Gloria Steins to in town hall talks in 10 years ago because she was working for the CIA to split the black women from the black men during the Black Power Movement with MS Magazine. Go back and read it. I'm against this persecution of right-wing religious people and telling them they've got no right to speak uh, if they want to pursue the traditional Christian family values in public. Uh, it comes right down to more recent examples where people have been sacked for saying white lives matter in corporate uh, sections that are paying due respect to the Black Lives Matter movement. We are creating enemies if we allow the anti-discrimination bureaucracies to move away from the class issue and the discrimination issue and just persecute our enemies. Thank you. Can I respond quickly? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd say uh, be very careful about believing what rant you read on YouTube. I mean, uh, I think you're probably talking about a guy called Burns, um, and you may well be reading something that Mark Latham has said, but not only has he never worked for me, he repeatedly attacks me. I've had never had any contact with him other than him largely attacking me. Uh, and and if, you, if you start believing that kind of crap, um, you know, that you think that someone worked for me and put 200 applications in, Maybe just a little step back and think, would that, is that actually likely? Is it actually likely that somebody works for David and has put 200 crazy applications in and I'm thinking I'm okay with that? Just a little rational step back um, because it's not. It doesn't happen. It's some sort of bizarre myth. I don't know where you've heard it, but don't believe everything you see on the internet. The other thing I'd say is this, the, um, the culture wars that, that have underpinned some of the complaints and concerns. Um, I absolutely believe we need to, you know, meet people where they're at. And, um, and not judge people for coming to an issue with a set of values that you hopefully want to challenge and, and, and direct them into a, into a path that is uh, going to be, you know, um, uh, less likely to do harm to others in society. So I believe we need to meet people where they're at, to not judge people for coming to an issue with a set of prepackaged values that, you know, they probably picked up in their childhood and their education. Um, but equally, we don't, I don't sign on to the argument that you're putting forward, that there's somehow some terrible bureaucracy in place that is disempowering privileged white men um, and that, that, that those bureaucracies need to be challenged because these poor group of privileged white men um, are having such a rough time of it maintaining their relative privilege and status in society. Um, I tell you, if there's one group of people that don't need protection and speaking as a privileged white man, it's privileged white men. <laughs> Um, let's get a bit of gender balance, I think. Yeah. Really glad you commented on that. Well, talk about it. Speak right into the microphone. Uh, look, this is getting a little bit off the human rights issue. But we're talking about making laws that often don't seem to actually have very much influence in the end. Um, and I, I haven't actually read the whole article uh, yet, but in the last Saturday paper, there was something about uh, bringing in Henry VIII's laws. Did you, anyone else read that article? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But once they were brought in, they couldn't be got removed. Special now, powers of the Prime Minister. Yeah, now I think that's a real...
we are in the city. So if something is sneaked through just before Christmas when everybody comes in, it's all nice and smooth. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. And, and quick, then if it's stuck there forever, I mean, we can't really look at law to be functional and to be, say what it means and no escape clauses and things. And if something's going to suddenly be stuck there forever, you know, that's just a little concern. Do we do we do it's a bit off the track. No idea. Okay. Anyway, I'm just saying. Well, I'm, I'm happy to address the Henry VIII clause issue if you want. Um, so Henry VIII clauses come from, it might surprise you, the time of Henry VIII, um, who wasn't much of a Democrat, and um, persuaded the Parliament, the then Westminster Parliament, to pass a law that enabled him to amend it and add other laws as he saw fit as the monarch without going back to the Parliament. So it allowed the executive to basically rewrite the statute book. And the Parliament, at the time it was a... a a deeply supine, highly critical, you know, very ineffective parliament, um, and you had a very powerful and, and um, a dictatorial monarch, he, he basically cowed the parliament to give him the right to rewrite laws. Um, and ever since then, anyone who believes in the Westminster system or parliamentary democracy have, have looked at Henry VIII um, laws um, and said, we, we, we better not do that again. That being said, the New South Wales parliament in the emergency COVID-19 response, and federally the same happened, but I, I know more intricately what happened in New South Wales, we handed the Attorney General a whole lot of Henry VIII powers to rewrite the way the Criminal Procedure Act worked, to re rewrite the, right, the way uh, civil um, proce um, legal procedure op operated, to rewrite the way sentencing laws and parole laws operated, we handed huge Henry VIII powers to the Attorney General because we had a desperate, urgent situation where the Parliament wasn't able to, to meet, or well, this was the argument, to rewrite the laws in time to allow for the criminal justice system and the prison system and the civil justice system to continue to operate with all the constraints that a pandemic puts on, on society. Um, and and we, we, I had some negotiations with the Attorney General when that legislation was given to us with only 72 hours notice, and we actually removed the provisions in there, all of those Henry VIII powers are time limited, and they all expire in, at, at the latest at September. Um, so they're all time limited. But there was a Henry VIII clause in the legislation that allowed the Attorney General to get rid of the limitation provisions that limited the Henry VIII clause, if you, if you follow that argument. And, um, and that's where we said, look, we understand we've got a pandemic. We understand you may need to rewrite these things. We understand all of this. We had some other arguments about limited, but we said we're not going to allow you to remove the limitations on the Henry VIII clause. And then eventually the government caved in and agreed. So we have Henry VIII clauses in place until September, and thankfully they will end in September and the attorney can't rewrite the laws to continue them forever. Hi, I'd just like to insert myself before time runs out on us because Something happened recently which, for me, the, the rubber did hit the road, and I didn't expect it. I stuck a, a, a notice on Macquarie's statute, a horrible thing at the end of Hyde Park North, about the people he'd uh, ordered to have killed, um, just like that. About 14 people were killed in the Appen Massacre, which is like south of Cronulla, north of Wollongong. Um, anyway, about that. Cold-blooded uh, orders that he'd given in 1816. Um, okay, I, I did that. I've done it lots of times. I was cycling back. I was intercepted by three uh, police cars on uh, uh, Collins Street. Um, this is a bit of a surprise. I was taken to Day Street. Bail was refused. I was beside a, a, a Larrakia gentleman from Darwin whose, whose brother had been killed 18 years before in Catherine. He'd been shot to death. He didn't really, he really, really didn't want to go to, to Surrey Hills lockup. And, I, and, and he was, I said, just try and keep calm. He did. And he was taken to Surrey Hills Lock Up. I said, oh, that's okay, I'm not going to go. <laughs> then bail was refused and I was taken to Surrey Hills Lock Up. It is the most appalling place I have seen. And I grew up reading Solzhenitsyn and, uh, uh, you know, the Thor generation, all the, you know, the people in the, in the camps and so on. It, it is a shocker. 
that there is no natural light, there is no clocks, there's nothing to read. The strip searched, um, handcuffs, uh, handcuffs when you're out of, out of the uh, cell. Horrible, horrible. This is fascinating to me. I was lucky I was only there a few hours uh, from 1 a.m. till 3.30 p.m. This is, and, and I'm really sorry for the Chen and for Vu who were left in the cell, and that you can be held there for seven bloody days. This is a shocker, and I think there's this whole netherworld of places like Golden Maximum Security Prison. This place just up, you know, literally a stone throw from here. They're like, it's shocking. It, innocent until, until proven guilty. I've never heard, I've never seen it so abrogated and so violated. That's why it's called the Ministry of Love up there. It's called yeah, the Ministry of Love. They didn't give you a panic cell, they would have picked you up. It's, all the, it's called the Corrected Services. There's nothing corrective about that. They should call it the, the, the brutalization services. That's what it should be. It must break every single human right you could ever want in a, in a, in a thing. I couldn't believe, and like, now it's like, uh, anyway, that's just my, I'm still sort of um, processing this and terrible thing which happens to the marginalized people in this society routinely. And we don't hear, I would never have known about it really. I, I could have some sort of, vague idea of it, but no, you have, it's a lived experience. And these people who do that, who pass the law and all the bloody bullshit, they should spend a couple of days, that's all I really want them to spend, in these places. And that would show them one thing or two. Lived experience, I can tell you. And I've just had a tiny taste of what so many people go through. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, <laughs> They've got padded cells for the working class there. We know what they're for. Legislation, an act 
protecting human rights, and you say Australia in the Western world at least is, is almost Robinson Crusoe in that regard. Um, would Australia have any more power, if it wanted to, to protect its citizen in Belmarsh Prison? Thanks for that question. Um, so with respect to the entrenched Bill of Rights, as in um, being part of our constitution, versus the question that we were asked tonight, which was the Human Rights Act, which while it sounds the same, is uh, a different kettle of fish, because we're talking about a legislative legislature going through parliament rather than something in our constitution. Um, the issue with something in our constitution is kind of multifold. First of all, it is a major effort. It is not a question of a bill being put through to Parliament and debated and voted on and amended and passed. It is something that to change the Constitution is a major undertaking. Um, as far as the rights that are in our Constitution, yeah, there's Jewish duty and not to have your home acquired by the government and a couple of other somewhat peripheral rights. So if we decided that we were going to make this current um, Human Rights Act embedded in the Constitution, first of all, we strike the same problem that Americans have been saying for centuries, which is now that, as Jefferson had mentioned, the um, right to bear arms is in their Constitution, no matter how well-meaning the legislators, legislators have been in the decades since, it's a very hard one to remove. And also, with respect to... Um, making something as part of the Constitution, and, and we both touched on the question of what rights do we look at. Now is to put it quite bluntly that the urgency of the Black Lives Movement notwithstanding is probably one of the lower times in Australia's human rights history. So having anything as part of the Constitution, while yes, it would be an ideal, now is probably not the best time to make those sort of long-reaching, far-reaching changes that would be very difficult to, to amend later. Majority of states, majority of yeah, No, I agree, Barry. This is not the time, I think, to, um, to make the... I mean, I think we should never, never step back from the arguments in favour of constitutional rights. Um, but I, I don't think now's the time we're going to achieve those rights. I think now's the time we're going to achieve some essential, potentially strategic rights under the Black Lives Matter movement. I think we can achieve rights there, um, but only if we continue the public pressure. Um, but even if we had constitutional rights, um, whatever constitutional rights we had in New South Wales wouldn't have any effect upon a citizen in the United Kingdom. Um, and, and, and in fact, what, what we see with Julian Assange is we see this, you know, relative this complicity amongst politicians and the political class in Australia with what's happening with Assange because they don't really want to confront challenging either the UK or the US, I think. So, um, but yes, any constitutional change we made here wouldn't impact that. Thank you. Hi, I just want to uh, <coughs> me, make a quick point um, to tie together what Tony was saying and just to run past the two speakers. Um, in relation to the situation where we have right now, I think, in Australia, where we actually have a secret trial going on. In all the years I've spent in this country, I never thought it would come to this. The, and I'll just preface this by, by saying that when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, he remarked in that book that a nation didn't become civilised until it was broken into ranks. And that's the key of our production. You have a group of wealthy and powerful people at the top, a group of people at the bottom who produce goods and services for those people, and the people at the bottom don't have any say in the decisions that are made on their behalf. Of course, gradually through the 19th century, representatives of working people got into power. But the other group of people that could intervene on behalf of the dispossessed was the trade union movement. But what I'm leading up to is by the time, by the time we get to the 20s, you have situations such as 1945 in Sydney, where when the American government was ushering the Dutch troops back into Indonesia to, to negate the Indonesian independence movement. 
The wharfies in Australia were being spoke. The wharfies refused to load the ammunition that was being put on the ships in Sydney and other military equipment, and it, and it put a spanner in the works. You can think of many other situations, I think, where the trade union movements have intervened in that process on behalf of the dispossessed. And one of the problems that we have that's developed and we now have since the 80s particularly, is that not only had the wealthy and power wanted to stop the union movement ever having that capacity, but Hawke and Keating took, took it away from the union movement as well. That was, to me, is a great project, is to strip that capacity away from the union movement to intervene on behalf of the possessed, dispossessed the way they did. And lo and behold, we are now in the year 2020 with the end product of all that, where there really is no other group, I think, who, you know, or very, very few in the way that it is, who can step in the way the union movement used to do, at least the progressive movement, but I just want to really think about it. Please, Yeah, look, I, I think that's a very valid point. Um, and certainly the, the uh, motivation and the impact of the unions when it comes to uh, advocating for people who are dispossessed but not necessarily in terms of their work structure has been quite mixed. So we are in a very different position to how we were when um, during Federation, when the unionists overwhelmingly were pro white Australia policy to um, as part of their protectionist uh, motivation. Now we've seen in many cases, yeah, people who have come, those very same 457 visas that the unions were very vocal against, many people who have been exploited in those situations have had their rights upheld by the unions in Australia. Um, and we've seen that happen in many cases, you know, with um, people who are coming to build the, the temple down, uh, not in Wollongong, you know, on the way down yep. there. Um, down so that, yeah, yep. down in Wollongong. A whole raft of them, people who have come to Australia on these visas um, or who are on other sort of uh, temporary visas who've had their rights protected. So I absolutely agree with that. Look, I do think that there's been a project at a state and a federal level to institutionalise unions, to make to have their power dependent upon the legislative framework from day to day, rather than the power they have to mobilise their membership and actually bring production to an end or challenge governments by mass mobilisation of the membership. And that, I think, you know, plenty of people can argue the history of the Accord one way or another, but I, whether that was an intentional or an unintentional outcome, I think that's what we saw with the Accord. We saw the ability of unions at a federal level to collectively organise, mobilise their membership and, you know, in uh, disrupt production. That was replaced by a nice legislative framework where the unions could engage with the rights given to them by Parliament at a particular time and then, you know, negotiate within the frame, a legislative framework um, under a federal um, industrial relations act, and then having become dependent upon the rights and the frameworks given to them by Parliament, when Parliament decided that they that 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 they no longer had the capacity to prevent legislative change, well, Parliament then progressively started turning those rights off, and that's what we saw with work choices, and we saw a bit of a pushback at that moment. But then we saw, I believe, the Labor Party largely continue the project with the Fair Work Act and continue to turn off those legislative rights. And, and they were able to achieve that because they had, um, partly with complicity of some, some, some parts of the union movement, they had managed to, to um, over time, destroy that capacity of unions to, to, to deliver mass strikes or mass stop mass work stoppages and 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 if you want to see a, a case in point at the moment look what's happening at a state level all the public sector unions some of which have 98 percent union density and membership right um some of them have 99 percent density but you know the, you're starting at 60 or 70 percent and you're working up to 99 percent density in the public sector unions and the Fed, the state government has come out and said well, we're going to put you all in a pay freeze um, you know, I can only think of one union that took industrial action. 
um, and that was the paramedics association and and god you know bless them for their action they said they were no longer going to build patients in ambulances and they were going to write slogans on the side about what a rat bag perite was um, uh, but only one union took is taking industrial or has taken industrial action and instead they're all engaged in this process down in the industrial relations commission to try and fight for a two and a half percent pay rise um, i think the architects of the accord would be very proud and having cowed the union movement and having seen parliaments create that sort of um, um, so, you know that absolute power that they have at the moment. When parliaments are the only power in town, they're very dangerous. Thank you. It's good to see the MEA at the Black Lives Matter yeah. thing. Sadly, no nurses association flags as far as I can see. Careful of politicians. Okay. Uh, just over a decade ago, the New South Wales Greens made a huge error in not opposing the uh, illegal, as you were saying, multinational Uber. Well, um, they're pushing into the taxi industry, they're destroying the taxi industry. Now, uh, since then, the taxi industry is, uh, it was corrupt at, at the top, and the Greens, through I think there's another one as I'm well. I'm going to yeah, just yep. um, address your question first. Regarding representation in Parliament, look, I, I, I don't know. Um, the Greens uh, certainly do have a lot more diversity and rep um, representation, and clearly the Senate also has that. But as far as how the major parties choose their candidates and get their candidates endorsed, that's obviously going to be something for, for the major parties. But looking at... The Labor Party in particular, if it does want to be seen as the natural home for people who are of migrant backgrounds or refugee backgrounds or um, have any sort of disability or any sort of uh, or, or LGBT rights, then they are going to have to change. Um, and certainly when it comes to racial diversity, I mean, I went through those numbers over and again, and they don't actually make it clear on, Parliament, in, on the Parliament House websites. They talk about people as coming from a culturally and linguistically diverse background as part of their um, people of different cultures. So you have, for example, Erica Betts included, um, Matthias Corman included. There's a whole slew of people who, it would, you know, there's, to put it bluntly, there's not like a whole bunch of 
Penny Wong's running around there. You know, they are they, they are quite loose with their term of culturally and linguistically. But when I made eight, seven or eight people of, of colour, I mean, that's, that's kind of generously describing Dave Sharma as an Asian. So, you know, that there really aren't that many. So when, when you have a look and you see what, what's going on in Parliament, they're the people, in the absence of this Human Rights Act, these are the people who are saying, don't worry, Parliament's got it, they're our representatives, and they're, and they're failing us. Um, yeah, I, I think a large part of it lies in not just the absence of um, um, diversity in terms of race and, and, um, and ethnicity. Um, we also see, uh, you know, a, a lack of reflection of the, the, the gender in, in Parliament. We also see a lack of reflection in um, economic circumstances in Parliament as well. Um, um, so, but, but I... I I, I, I sometimes look at them and I see them all coming together and they're not inherently bad people. Like, you know, many of them get into politics for, for something like the right reason. They're not there because they want to be venal and corrupt. Some do, you know, there are, there are some, you know, really clear examples. But by and large, they get into politics for the right reason. And I, I think to myself, well, imagine if one day all of those politicians in the New South Wales Lower House and the New South Wales Upper House of the Federal Parliament just one day decided to say, well, look, actually... You know, we're going to screw all those vested interests that got me here. Um, we, we may well burn our future with the political party, but we're just going to spend the next three years doing what we think in collectively is the right thing. And we're going to talk amongst ourselves and we're going to come up with some good answers. I mean, that would be, um, it would be a, a revolutionary change if Parliament actually became a debating chamber where we actually debated issues and considered issues. But, but I mean, even though they're individually not bad people, by and large, um, the, the structures that are in place within the major parties themselves prevent them from acting on even their own good intentions. And you will, I will repeatedly see um, politicians from other political parties who I kind of, you know, I have, I have some regard for as individuals. They'll say to me after they've voted through some particularly vile piece of legislation, they'll say, oh, David, I heard your speech. It was a great speech. You know, I would have liked to have voted against that, but you know how it is. And, you know, or, you know, oh, that was lovely. You know, I'm so glad you said that. And I said, well, why the fuck did you vote for it then? You know, um, and, and so it's not even just about getting the right individuals in. The structures that are in place, that, that, that the vested interests that keep them, that keep the right people in a position of precariousness within their, those major parties and will tear them down if they speak against it or are seen to act against it. It's those vested interests that, that, that are, I think, the, the major problem. It's not just about getting the right colour of people. They're not necessarily bad people. They're like ordinary people. But it's the corporate donors, it's the, it's the numbers people, um, it's those structures in very undemocratic political institutions, which are the major parties that I think are, we should be focusing as much attention on as the parliament itself. And nobody knows how the Liberal Party operates. Nobody knows how the Labour Party operates. And that's one of our key problems. <laughs> Can I, oh, I can deal with it. Can, can I recommend one film that does show, give an insight into how these parties work? And that's a film that Greenpeace has made recently with uh, someone who came to politics in the pub, which was Michael West, the economist. And it's called Dirty Power, um, Burnt Country. And that, not for the state level, but actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure that doesn't. And that shows the web of money and influence. That, uh, that we, and it's a, but as Chomsky says, we're the other superpower. We are the superpower, the people. And it's up to us. We've got tremendous uh, power as citizens. This is my propaganda spiel. And uh, I'd like to... Um, uh, we don't have medals for people who come and speak here, but I'd like to give you... Both, um, I was going to sell these badges for vast amounts of money and retire, but they didn't sell very well. When injustice come, becomes law, Resistance becomes duty, and that's uh, a U.S. president. But Jefferson, I'm what, what still waiting what? for the Uber answer. <laughs> right. Oh, do you want me to deal with that quickly? Yeah. Do you want to deal with yeah. the Uber yeah. answer? Yeah. Uh, look, I, I think um, blaming any one act of the New South Wales Parliament on um, and saying that's what allowed this enormously brutal, um, 
highly um, um, steroid-driven thing called global capitalism to put Uber into the New South Wales marketplace is, is I think, probably overestimating the power of the New South Wales Parliament. Um, I think that the taxi industry was notoriously corrupt, failed to serve the interests of either the, the public or the drivers, and was run to just get a tight little cabal of license plate holders to make um, obscene wealth over a long period of time. And it was always going to fall over and collapse. It got knocked over by Uber, um, and you know I think that was done without anything like the appropriate levels of checks and balances. Um, and I think we need to regulate the gig economy. And I think that's one of the, the, the major jobs in front of us. Thankfully, there is actually a, a parliamentary committee looking at the future of work. And one of the key things I want to do is regulate the gig economy. And there are examples about how we can do it. It's not beyond us. We, we regulate the way lorry owner drivers operate in New South Wales. We have minimum rates and we have a whole lot of really useful contract determinations for lorry owner drivers. And we should expand that kind of regulation across the gig economy and actually put in basic minimum rates for, for gig workers and basic rights for gig workers. But I think um, when you see global capitalism going in one particular direction and saying, well, that's the moment um, that you know, one piece of legislation allowed this to happen, I think you're probably misunderstanding the forces of history. Can I, can I just ask um, one, one, one really uh, quick, but we, we have, there are demonstrations that we have on Fridays actually, um, at the, uh, at the uh, Town Hall steps. Yeah. Just a minute. There's us on one side, the refugee rights people on the other, there's the Assange people on the other. I just yeah. want to tell everyone about that, at 4.30pm, and we'd like everyone to join us. As well as that, myself and Ungerin and a few other people, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a blow into this. On Wednesday at 11 a.m., we go outside Coleman's office, the immigration minister's office, um, and we have never been allowed to see him in 10 months, or, or you haven't. You've been there, going there a great longer time than myself. Uh, he's never answered our letters. We can't see him. Is there no bloody do job description for these people that they actually have to do something to get the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we pay them? They have to see their rep representatives. And we've got people from his electorate there, not just, you know, low ends like me, uh, or from other places, but Who, actually... Who's the minister? Coleman, David Coleman, he's Minister for Immigration. And where's his office? Reesby. Reesby, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, just, is there, is there a job description? Wednesday, what time? Is it? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah. Is, is there a job description for, for these representatives to actually require no. to see the people who they supposedly represent? Uh, well, look, I mean, there is actually no job description for an MP, and, and I wouldn't necessarily want the major parties to write my job description either. Um, uh, so, look, the, it's, an, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting occupation, being an MP. Um, you don't have any minimum hours, and you don't have any maximum hours. You don't have any annual leave, but you don't have any obligation to turn up to work. Um, and um, you really make of it as you choose to make of it. If you want to work hard, you work hard. If you don't, you don't. And, um, and the, the test is meant to be getting thrown out at the next election if you don't live up to your thing. That's a very inadequate workplace um, assessment test in my observations. But I've got to say, it's one of the strangest occupations I've ever had. You don't have any minimum hours, you don't have any maximum hours, you don't have any annual leave, but you also don't have any obligation to turn up to work. It's really, you make of it what you do. Okay, thank you. We'll have to wind up, I'm afraid. <laughs> 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 right. Okay. This is uh, when injustice becomes law, resistance becomes duty. Thank you, uh, Dr. Barry Fazantog, and thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, when, when's the next, uh, when's the next uh, uh, meeting? Okay. You want to read it? Okay, the next uh, politics in the pub here will be on. Tuesday, July 21, so two weeks from now. The topic is mental health and unending crisis, question mark. And the speaker is Ian Westmoreland. He's the founder of an organisation called Mentoring Men. What's the website to get tonight's one repeated? On YouTube. We'll be going up on the Politics in the Pub. Yeah, the original Sydney Politics in the Pub Facebook oh, page. Oh, 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 you. No, it's <laughs> go to the Facebook page, it'll be there. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thank you very much. Nice yeah, you too. I think I saw you once. Were you at the um, Atheist, the uh, secular group? Yes.
<laughs> no, I, I went to go and talk about something. Uh, that being said, I, you know, I fundamentally defend anyone's right to have faith if they want to. I'm glad the way I thought, yes, I'm going to nicely lead into you with my... Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Now, you said put the, the um, although you put the social argument on the Well, let's see. Australian Human Rights Act. So, yeah. And there's a slew 